The following interview was conducted with Sam Perrone, former faculty member, Department of Chemistry at Purdue uh, in the College of Science for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, March 5, 2010, uh, by phone at his residence in California. Welcome, Dr. Perrone, and good afternoon to you. And uh, let's get started if you'll tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Okay. Uh, I was born in Rockford, Illinois. And uh, that's October 1st, 1938. Okay. Do you have parents and siblings in early school yeah. or grade school? Go ahead. Uh, my parents were um, Frank and Celia Peroni. Uh -huh. And um, I went to uh, grade school in Rockford and uh, high school. And, uh, in fact, attended uh, Rockford College, which is a local college there. Well, did you live on campus? Or? Uh, no, I didn't. I lived at home. Okay. Tell us a little about campus life and uh, any professors that kind of you kind of got touch base with, still touch base with, or when you were there. Yes. Good. Yes. Good. As a matter of fact, yeah. Good. Um, my uh, the professors that I recall uh, specifically were my uh, chemistry professors, uh, and they they were pretty young uh, when I was there. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, one was Dr. Justine Walhout, and uh, the other was uh, Calvin Huber. Um, and uh, Dr. Walhout uh, retired from Rockford College and, oh, about a decade ago, I guess. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Huber, was, uh, he left Rockford College and went on to teach at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Oh, okay. Sounds good. And I know you got you were Phi Beta Kappa. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Uh, were you? Did you belong to a fraternity while you were there? Uh, no, they didn't okay. have. Oh, they didn't have them. Okay. Okay. What was the size of the uh, student body at that time? Student body was about um, oh, two hundred mm -hmm. uh, full-time students. Okay. Nice. College. Nice Very small cool. course classes. Yes. <laughs> okay, and then uh, after you after. Uh, and you graduated in 59, and then did you go on to grad school after that? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, I went to the University of Wisconsin. Okay. And got your Ph.D. then in what? Analytical, uh, analytical chemistry. Analytical chemistry, and okay. my, my major professor was Irving Shane, uh -huh. who uh, actually went on to become chancellor at the University of Wisconsin. Oh, very good. Good person to keep in touch with. Yes. <laughs> uh, did you ever serve in the military, Dr. Prune? No. Okay. Uh, how about your career path before you came to Purdue in 62? Uh, I went directly from Wisconsin to Purdue oh, okay. as, as an assistant professor in, in 1962. Good. Were they doing, how did you, were they doing recruiting on, on campus up in Wisconsin or? No. Okay. Uh, no. Uh, okay. They, uh, my major professor got a letter. Uh, indicating that uh, there was an opening at Purdue for uh, an assistant professor, and and they were, you know, looking at uh, uh, fresh PhDs, okay. and uh, and that's and so I applied and uh, interviewed in April of uh, 1962 and was offered the job that month and uh, accepted. Very good. What was the camp? Well, but uh, where'd you live when you first came here? Tell us about uh, your initial housing. I uh, lived in Lafayette okay. in, a rent, in a rental home. Okay. Actually, at that time, 1962, there were very few apartments available, okay. uh, and practically no apartment buildings. So, uh, you know, finding uh, lodging in 1962 was very difficult. It was a challenge. Yeah. It was right. Were you married at that time, sir? Yes. Okay. Um, so tell us about the early, your, early, your initial thing and some of the courses and things uh, when you came came on board in the chemistry department. Who was the head at that time? Uh, Earl McBee. Oh, okay. All right. E. McBee. Okay. All righty. Go ahead. Tell us a little bit about the beginnings of your tenure there. In the well, uh, I was, uh, as a fresh assistant professor, of course, they gave me a relatively light teaching load so that I could get my research program going. Uh -huh. But I was, uh, I did teach, the first semester I taught the um, intermediate level uh, uh, analytical chemistry course that was kind of a dual level course. Uh -huh. And um, 
uh, that was a challenge for me uh, because uh, when I went through uh, graduate school, I, I had never done any teaching. I had I had a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship mm-hmm. for the first year, and then I had uh, National Science Foundation fellowships for the second and third year. Oh, okay, very mm-hmm. good. So I had never done any teaching. So this is. Welcome so, to the welcome to the troops, right? Talk, talk about going from the frying pan right into the fire. <laughs> was yeah. the was the class a large size class? It was a good yes, it was a large class. There were about um, I, my recollection was there were about forty students. Oh, okay, class. did 40 you graduate students? Yeah, that was pretty, were the, pretty were there, good size class. Yeah, were there TAs? Did you have some help? Were there TAs available at that time? The yeah. teaching assistants, or did you run or, the, pretty much yourself? I did. You know that class I did myself. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think I might have had TAs available, but I, uh, but not for that class. Sure. Okay. All right. And then tell us. Then did you get started in your research? Tell us. Th- tell us a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, Purdue set me up with uh, instrumentation that I needed to get started, and um, I uh, had no graduate students at first, so I really. Sure. Worked on worked on the projects myself. Uh-huh. Uh, my my office was also my lab, so I had a uh, I had basically a two man lab in the chemistry building that was my office, <laughs> my lab, and so I you know I'd, I would uh, you know, get up from my desk and go over to the lab bench and work. So I, I got uh, a publication out that first year. Good. And um, and picked up a couple of graduate students, and so by the, by the second year, I was, I had about three or four publications out. Very good. Very. That uh, what you're talking about, your office and the lab sound, sounds like a, the uh, studio apartments. All it's yeah, a package deal. Right, you know, all, <laughs> all you needed, all you needed was a Murphy bed, and you'd been home free. <laughs> that's right. And, and, yeah, that's what I needed. Except it wasn't, it wasn't air conditioned. No, oh, of course. Oh, my goodness, no. <laughs> this, was, this was the old uh, chemistry building. Sure. Yeah. This was what's now known as Weatherall, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, were you on any uh, committees at that time, any faculty committees in the uh, department? I'm, I'm sure I was. Okay, okay. <laughs> I can't remember them. I, I, I know that I was on uh, a committee to organize the summer. I mean, I was the committee. Okay. To organize the summer. We used to have summer uh, picnic conferences jointly with uh, – Indiana University Chemistry Department and, oh, super. Uh-huh. And, Notre, and Notre Dame. Okay, okay. And uh, I organized it that year, uh, 63, I guess it was the summer of 63, mm-hmm. uh, and it was held at Turkey Run. Um, that's uh, That was one committee that I was on. I, sure. I can't remember any sure. of the others. Okay. One of the publications I noticed that you did, you got, it was published in the ERIC, that technical report on introduction of digital computer technology into the undergraduate chemistry lab that was about 1976. Uh, could you tell us a little about that particular? It must have been or certainly research that went along yeah, that with was, that. Yeah, that was that was really a very important thing. Good. Uh, uh, the um, you know one of the questions on this sheet was that you sent me was uh, you know an outstanding event in my life. Right. Exactly. And of course, you know. That's good. There have been many. <laughs> but, that's but fine. The, but the one that stands out that's related to Purdue and related to the question you just asked me uh-huh. was uh, in the summer of 1967, I was um, invited to spend the summer uh, as a visiting scientist out at Lawrence Livermore Lab mm-hmm. in uh, Livermore, California. It's a right. national laboratory. Right. Well, they, uh, it turns out that the, the scientists, I was excited to go there and spent the summer there. The whole family went. Um, and the, uh, Livermore at that time was really ahead of the curve in uh, adapting uh, computers to laboratory instrumentation. I mean, you know, in, in, in 1967, that was, that was the cutting edge of, um, of uh, uh, laboratory Oh yeah, innovation. Oh yeah, and right. So I was right there on the ground floor. I mean, I was there, you know, before there were even there were mic- microcomputers didn't even exist at that time. So I got in on the ground floor, and when I came back to Purdue, uh, after spending that summer away, I um, uh, first thing I did was uh, tried to organize a uh, 
a graduate course that really dealt with this new technology and, and its impact on um, chemistry and uh, scientific instrumentation in general. And uh, it, it got a, a very broad response across the university. There were lots of people who came from other departments to participate in that in Good. that program. Wonderful. And what what I, what grew out of it was I I got a National Science Foundation um, contract uh, grant to develop a, a summer course for college teachers on computer instrumentation, and the the first one was held in the uh, summer of 1968. Uh huh. And uh, then uh, that program. That summer program, which was supported by the National Science Foundation for a number of years, uh, four or five, six years, I can't remember now, um, was then that that then uh, became the springboard for uh, incorporating this kind of technology into the undergraduate laboratory. And that was the, the question that I think you right. brought up, uh, the Journal of Chemical Education article that I wrote Right. Back in '76, was the subject of that of that uh, development. Very. Did you, then you ran it for uh, you said for several years, but, but in the summertime would that be? Yeah. You, okay. We, we ran we ran the the summer course, which was for college teachers and for uh, you know professionals. Sure. Uh, okay. It was an ex, you know it, it was in the it was it was um, offered through the. Uh, uh, University Extension okay. program. Okay. Okay. Very. What kind of computers were you using? How was that? How how was it type? Yeah. Well, back in in sure. 1967 when we set this up, yeah, uh, uh, we were using uh, the very first uh, integrated circuit uh, model of computer produced by Hewlett Packard. Wow. <laughs> the very first one. I mean, it was uh, you know it, it it was about the size of a small refrigerator, <laughs> but you could put it but you could put it on a, a laboratory desk and you could hook it up to laboratory instrumentation yeah. and it was it was among the first of its kind. Uh, it's kind of nice to look back when you hear about those things, like the room yeah. where the big IBMs used to be and whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing, amazing, and uh, and it, they were affordable and it, they were affordable in the sense that uh, the. Uh, you, for about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, you could have a computer that had about one tenth of a percent of the capability of, uh, sure. you know, of a uh, iPhone. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, in uh, did you get were how did the, would you get promoted while you were uh, during the time you were here as well? Yes, I okay. yeah I was promoted in in nineteen sixty seven. Okay. Um, after five years, I was promoted to assistant pr associate. Okay. And then in 1971, I believe it was, I was promoted to um, full professor. Mm. And at the time, they told me I was the youngest to ever be promoted to full professor in the chemistry department. So that, that that's was kind of, that's, you mark that rewarding. down. Get a plaque in your room on that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the chemistry. But one of the things that uh, sort of uh, read an article that Hot Atom Chemistry Symposium. Mm -hmm. That was in '66. What exactly was the nature of that? Do you recall that being held? Yeah, I recall that, but okay. uh, and, you know, but I that was not in my field sure. at all. Sure, I just wondered because there's an article in the uh, vertical file on that, so I just it was sort of interesting w in reading about it at, at that point in time in '66 when it was held. Um, the dedication of the, uh, the building, which is now um, that would be the Brown Building, correct? Yes. In 1973. And you uh, can make you interacted. I'm sure with Dr. Brown. Of course, we. I should tell you, we were the archives and special collections did get his papers, so we have those here, and oh. they're in the process of being, you know, prepared so sure. that they researchers can can use them. Um, I was here uh, the day that the announcement came out about the the uh, Nobel laureate, and uh, uh -huh. so that was kind of, that was kind of exciting, I think, and I'm sure yeah. everybody, everybody. It was an exciting day for everybody. <laughs> Yes, I, I do remember that very well. Um, would you talk, just make a comment on the dedication of that of the building. Did you move into that one, or did you stay in the one where you were at? No, I moved into the new building. Okay. And uh, it's, uh, and uh, that was, and of course, had a lot of interactions with the.
designers in order to, you know, design the specific research area that I was going to be using. Right. So but that was, uh, yeah, that was a that was a very major event. Yeah, I would say so. Right. And you had a lot of key people. You had um, the chairman and, and the uh, CEO of DuPont came, and Glenn Seaborg, who had been head of AEC and then had left there and was out at, at uh, Berkeley at the time. So you had quite a, a line of speakers for that dedication. We did. And, uh, of course, the president at that time would have been was Dr. Han Dr. Hansen. That's right. Yeah. And when, when you came, the, the president was Dr. Hubby. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Right. Okay. How about the uh, that symposium that uh, for Harold Brown? Do you rec uh, recall that it looks like it was 1980? It would have been the year after he got the Nobel Prize. Was that kind of a special thing that you, this department had? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, okay. I, don't, I don't remember the symposium. They probably did. Did you? Can any comments on Dr. Brown? Did uh, you interact with him? I did. Okay. Um, he was. Uh, we interacted. I, I, he was not. Um, we were not the same kind of chemist, so sure. we didn't. Sure we didn't understand. interact. We didn't interact uh, regularly. Right. But we did interact um, whenever there was uh, a meeting of full professors, and I was after I had been promoted to full professor. Mm -hmm. I would be in on all of the full professor meetings, and of course he would always be there. Oh sure. And uh, and I and, and I just listened to his words of wisdom. And uh, those have, uh, those have carried with me uh, ever since. So, yeah. very good, good mentor. He was an excellent mentor. Right. As a professional, right. no doubt about it. Right. Okay. Um, were you a faculty fellow at any time, on any of the no. residence halls? Were you no. a fact fellow? Okay. That program has changed quite a bit, um, and you probably may or may or not be aware they have many of the residence halls, they've sort of consolidated the dining facilities, like we have the four dining courts, so they can eat almost any place. And so I have been a fact fellow at um, Tarkington, but they res the eating facilities are not there. They either have to go to Ford or wherever they want to go. So it's a little bit different, and some of the events they used to have are changed over time, too. But it's yeah. still, it's still the program still goes. Um, talk about family, um, you have wife and children, did an, and did they come to Purdue? Uh, yeah, I had, well, uh, when I was there, uh -huh. um, my, uh, we, we had four children. Okay. Three of them, uh, attended Purdue, uh, two graduated from Purdue. Okay. Anybody in chemistry? Nobody in chemistry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you know, they strike out on their own. Yeah. Um, now let's see. You got a couple of awards and honors. Let's talk a little bit too that that I I see in in your novel. I want to talk about. You're an author, and can you tell us a little bit about that? Even your wife said you're doing writing books, which is in interesting titles. Uh, that Einstein's t uh, tunnel looks like something I'd certainly like to check out and have a read. Then you got an award for honorable mention from the Independent Publishers Book of the Year for mystery and suspense. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm really proud of that. It's. Um, well, to, to go back to your sure. original question, right. uh, yeah, I am an author. Uh, I always wanted to write fiction. Okay. Uh, and of course, as a professor and as a research scientist, I've, I did a lot of writing, uh, publishing papers and, pub and, and a couple of books. Sure. Um, and writing proposals and all of these things. And so that involves an awful lot of writing, but it's all, you know, it's all nonfiction. It's business. That's right. um, it's a different always, format. A different, totally different format. But right. I mean, it certainly hones your writing skills, mm -hmm. but not it's not creative writing. <laughs> That's right. So I always wanted to do creative writing, and, and over the years, I just I basically collected ideas of, for for novels that I might write someday. Okay, good. And, and threw them into a uh, a file drawer, and um, then when I retired uh, in 1999. I, I took early retirement from San Jose State University, uh -huh. where I was at the time, and um, I did some consulting. But then, I, in my spare time, I decided I would like to to start writing, and so I did. And my first novel was published in 2002, and then I published. A, but in the last uh, seven years, I've published about or eight years, I've published another five or six novels. So, oh, good. So that's 
Uh, That's very nice. Let me ask you, one of them uh, that I see that you wrote, Crisis on Flight 101? Yes. What was, what's the nature of, what's the, the nature of that particular book, what's the topic on that? Uh, well, that's an interesting. Uh, the title is, is misleading. In fact, uh, one of the reasons that the publisher liked it so much was that it was a misleading title. Okay. Um, it's a science fiction st uh, story. It's a sequel to my first book. And, it, and the first three books, concluding with Einstein's Tunnel, is a trilogy. So they're, all three of them are science fiction and um, deal with time travel. Okay. Now, and... and, and Flight 101, on um, that book, the center piece of that book is a flight on uh, a 1939 uh, transatlantic flying boat, one of the old uh, clipper ships. Clipper ships that Pan Am yeah. used to fly? That Pan Am used to fly, right, where they, where they had sleeping cabins and dining rooms and things like that. Right. It, was, it, was like, it was like flying... It was it was like a fly. It was literally a flying boat. It was right. like it was it was like life on a passenger ship, except in the air. Right. Um, so the centerpiece of the book was a was a flight on. Uh, it was actually called Flight 101 from New York to um, England, and it was overnight, uh, and um, passengers sleep on board, and the, the so the 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 premise of the story was that the there was a passenger on board that flight who uh, was crucial to the development of the atomic bomb. And uh, it, the idea was that uh, that person um, was supposed to have been kidnapped during that flight. And on board? You mean during the flight? During the flight. It was supposed to be, well, it was supposed to be, well, sure. the flight lands two or three places. Okay, gotcha before it gets to England. And at the third stop, which would have been in Ireland, he was supposed to have been uh, taken off the plane and eventually brought to Nazi Germany. And if that had happened, the Nazis would have been, would have had the atomic bomb before oh. we did. Interesting scenario. Yeah, so right. that's the scenario. That, sure, that, interesting. That, that the Second World War would have turned out differently had that happened. Right. And the time travel element allows people to go back in time to either make it happen or not make it happen. Right. And that's the that's that's that, that's the premise of the book. And then the third book, Einstein's Tunnel, uh -huh. is the is the book that pulls it all together uh, and undoes undoes all the damage that was done in the second book. That second one. What about that uh, another one that I see you wrote, the Star Sight Project? Yeah, that was my first. Novel. That's your first one. Okay, okay, all righty. Now your uh, your career path. You incidentally that little resume that I pulled off of there helped to me to put it in perspective that after you did leave and then you went to Lawrence Livermore after That's you left right. Purdue? Okay. That's right. And then San Jose State. That's right. Okay. And now, did you, uh, did they have, when you say early retirement, did they have a similar plan that, that Purdue has here, kind of a half time, or did, was it just, just plain early retirement? That no, I just, I, I just retired totally. Um, okay. And, but, I, I mean, they, they named me a, an emeritus professor. Good. Right? And I was able to go back periodically to teach some courses, and of course, use the facilities. Sure. But uh, but in, but in fact, I, I at that time I really wanted to go off and do uh, other things. I wanted to uh, uh, to just be a freelance consultant, which mm -hmm. uh, which I did for a few years, and and I wanted to write. Okay. I was going to ask you about reti your retirement activity. So you, you did consulting and then your writing. Is that pretty much? Yes. Uh, okay. Right. And then uh, then my wife and I moved up to the um, foothills, um, and that was in 2001. Uh -huh. Up to the foothills, and uh, and uh, so th that's where we live now. And, uh, and we still have a lot of activities down in the in the San Francisco Bay Area, sure. but most of the time we're up here. All right. Do you, do you like it up there? Love it. Yeah, oh. it's beautiful. So, uh, when she mentioned that, it just sounded great to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is great. <laughs> and we, have, we have a beautiful view, and then uh, we have that. And, and it's just a slower pace of life up there. It's really yeah. nice. Very good. Um, do, you have, do you recall a Purdue tradition when you were here? Was there any tradition that kind of sticks in that you recall? 
like you know, me. Oh, good. A lot. There good. are a lot of them, really. But the ones, what sticks out the most okay. in my, my memory are the, are the football weekends. I mean, those. There you go. Those are, you know, those are the most memorable, and you can't find anything like that anywhere else. That's interesting. And, and how do you uh, elaborate a little bit on that? It's sort of unique because, you know, the Colts, are, they have the games, the Colts, and mm-hmm. they are outside the stadium. But I think ours is different. It is different. And, right. it is, you know, when, when we moved here or when I, when I moved out here uh-huh. um, in, uh, in 81, sure. it was um, – I really missed the, you know, the football season and the Purdue football and, and whenever I go back to visit Purdue, I try to make it during the football season so I can see a game. So that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a tradition that's carried on. But, uh, you know, we, we, we try to get into the um, football, college football scene here by going to the Stanford games and sure. the Cal games. Right. And we, we even got season tickets with Stanford. But it's just, it's not the same. And the reason is, <laughs> the one reason is because the weather is so different. Right. Uh, and, but the other reason is because uh, if you live in the Bay Area, um, there's an awful lot uh, of opportunities that compete for your attention. And, you know, you've got the 49ers on Sunday, you've got oh, Stan right. Saturday, you've got a concert on Thursday night, and you've got, you know, you just, and, and, you, and you can go skiing the next weekend, and you can go someplace else, you can go out on the ocean the following day. So people, th- their lives are not as highly focused on the football weekend as they are in a Big Ten right. town like yeah. Lafayette. And that's and there's just a totally different atmosphere. And, uh, you know, the anticipation of the football season uh, in, you know, in, uh, in West Lafayette, uh, it, it's there all year round. Right. And exactly. uh, it's not that way out here, and it's uh, it's not it's not that way you know anywhere else that I've been, but I, I'm sure that there you know you get to schools that are in smaller communities, Probably. and yeah. you'll you'll get the same kind of atmosphere. Sure. But that's right. that's that's my my fondest yeah. recollection. Sir. I'll uh, make a comment. I'll, uh, when we log off on before I hang up, I'll log, I'll make a comment on football. It's it's kind of interesting uh, to me. Um, can, uh, outstanding event. Uh, we, you mentioned one earlier. My, was there another one that you cared to that you wanted to comment on, or do the, about your research and how that took off on the the computers and the program well, itself? I, I'd say you know okay. one of the most memorable events for for me, of course, was just the first day that I came to Purdue. Great. I the, when I when I came on my interview trip, yeah, you know, I came from. Madison, Wisconsin. It was like the f- uh, a few days into April. It might have been April third or fourth or something like that. Mm-hmm. When I, and I drove down from Madison. I, now in Wisconsin, it was still winter. Oh yeah. When I got to West Lafayette, it was spring. Mm. And you know, students were out playing touch football on the uh, you know on the campus grounds there. You know, you know where you know where that big. Uh, where they now have the fountain there in front of Hubby Hall. Right, exactly. Yeah, well, that used to be all open space there. It there used to be green. parking there before they built yeah. the MSW building. Exactly, and that's where Grand Prix originally got started, the second yeah, well, year or something, because well, they used to run around there. Students were out there playing touch football, and, <laughs> and it was, you know, they were out in the shorts and t-shirts, sure. and, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, yeah, it's like I died and gone to heaven. You know, <laughs> right. I, I, le- I left. I left Wisconsin in the winter, and I got to <laughs> do, and it was spring. In Nirvana, you have arrived. <laughs> right. And, and my previous, one of my previous interviews for a job had been at, at the University of Minnesota. Okay. And I had gone up there during a 12-inch snowstorm. Oops. And, and you know, and I woke up the next morning for my interview, and it was 24 below zero. <laughs> so, I, so, you know, that, that first that first introduction to Purdue was uh, it stands out in my mind, and uh, that that was that was a memorable. That was, that was memorable. Right. I'll never forget that. You said earlier. Do you still come? Have you been back on campus uh, in the last couple of years? Do you still come back for any visits or anything? I do come back. Okay. And, uh, in fact, I was there two years ago for the Purdue Iowa game. Oh, okay. And uh, you know, my son is graduate student at Iowa now. Uh huh. And so we, um, 
we got all of the kids together. Uh, you know, all of all of my kids live out. Uh, four children live out in the Midwest, and my wife and I have two. Uh, she has two, mm-hmm. and so uh, we have six all together. But uh, uh, I get back to the Midwest to see, or we both go back there to see all of the kids. And so all of us got together um, in Lafayette for a reunion. Oh, super. For a Purdue game and to go to Arnie's to, to get Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, That's we all, there. it's a big home, big reunion. Yes, it was. Right. Yeah. Very nice. Um, any questions that I, that or a comment that you'd like to, that something that I forgot or anything that uh, you'd like to, I'll leave it up to you. Well, one thing that I, I, I wanted to mention to you, and I can't, uh, I can't pull it up right now, but there was a Newsline article. Uh-huh. Do they still have Newsline? Uh, Newsline, no. this was back in the 60s. No. I, was it a Purdue publication? Yeah, it was a oh. Purdue publication. Oh, I don't know. I don't Not like the... once a month of a newsworthy thing. You know, nowadays it comes out online. Right, yeah. But, but I, does, I, we have like Purdue today. They've changed. There's a lot, there used to be Monday Memo. There were a lot, but they've all changed over the over time. Yeah, and I'm not sure that that was the name of it either. Okay. But it was it was like a monthly or periodic publication that came out, and I, it came out in I think 1968. Okay. All right. And it and it and it, and it, it, fe- it featured me. Okay. And um, uh, my colleague, you know, Harry Pardue. Okay. And some of our graduate students who had put together this um, computer instrumentation course. Super. So if you know, I I'll I, have to I try to see if I can track that down. Yeah, if you can't, I, I know I have copies. Okay, I can't I'll, see, I'll let you. I'll let you know if I'm successful. Okay, <laughs> well, that would be something that would be uh, useful. Right. Okay. Uh, well, I think that unless you, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. It's been wonderful. Well, I've and, I've enjoyed it too, and yeah. I'm glad. Uh, I'm really excited that you're doing this kind well, of. Well, we are too. It just worked out very, very well. I'm going to log uh, log off, but I'll leave the phone on. I'm going to make mm-hmm. a count.